welcome to you all, ladies, gentlemen, ocean friends. We are very happy to, to see you here today in this launching webinar of the thematic working group two of the EU International Ocean Governance Forum. Facilitation will be done today by myself, Pierre Strasser, my colleagues, Camille and Nicolas from Acteon. And we hope that you will get a, a smooth webinars and we'll be able to uh, share with you ideas, solutions, and give you a bit of feeling of what is ahead of us in this new process. The main focus of this uh, webinar uh, is on one side to present the International Ocean Governance Forum that has been launched and then to present and clarify what its thematic working group two will discuss and address. This thematic working group two has a bit of a long title uh, as you, you all saw from the discussion papers that were sent and shared reducing pressures on ocean and seas and creating the condition for sustainable blue economy. So there's a very wide uh, range of issues we are uh, going to uh, cover today and present to you. And then we will present the way forward after this launching webinars and give you some light on the steps that will follow and some key milestones. If I go to the uh, focus of the thematic working group as compared to some of the issues discussed yesterday, here what is important is that we would like to get your views on the challenges, the solutions, and also on the questions that we have uh, shared with you in the discussion paper to refine, adapt them, and then get a clear view on how to proceed in the work of the thematic working group. If I go back to the agenda itself that you have received, the first session on setting the scene of the International Ocean Governance Forum and this thematic working group with opening remarks and welcome remarks from uh, Commissioner Virginius Sinkevicius and then from Peter Thompson, I will come back to it later, and then from uh, Veronica Weitz from the European Commission uh, presentation of the salient features of the International Ocean Governance Forum that is launched. And I will complement this with a few elements on the focus of the thematic working group too. Then we will go to the, I would say the meat, uh, the main component of the webinar, which is to present to you uh, the different topics we propose to address. There are five. I will come back to them individually. Uh, what is important is that for each topic, we will have a discussant. We'll get then a presentation of the questions that are in front of us, and then we will get questions and answers with all participants. And then finally, a session with final words and presentation of key elements on the way forward. And the conclusion will be made by uh, Mariana Manse and John Brinkat, which are the two co-chairs of this thematic working group two uh, from the European Commission. Now let's officially open the webinar. Uh, and I'm virtually very pleased to welcome uh, Commissioner Virginius Sinkevicius. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining our webinars on international ocean governance. I would have liked to welcome you in Brussels, but we must to adapt to the situation. Of course, right now, the public health crisis is the most urgent challenge to address. But by holding this digital conference, we want to recall that our oceans cannot just wait until we get out of the crisis and that we have a duty to keep the momentum of this super year for the oceans 2020. What's more, by turning this major event on ocean governance into a virtual meeting, maybe we pave the way for a new climate-friendly approach 
to international policymaking. Let's prove that it can be done by actively contributing to the discussions. Today's webinars are part of the EU's International Ocean Governance Forum. This forum unites stakeholders and experts within and beyond the EU, guiding the EU to ensure the conservation and the sustainable use of our oceans and seas worldwide. The ambitions are clear. More than 150 countries have adopted the 2030 Agenda, including SDG 14 on life below water. But with only 10 years to go, we need to scale up our efforts to achieve what we agreed to. First of all, we need to strengthen the international policy framework. This is a basic prerequisite. Some of the ongoing policy processes, such as the BBNJ negotiations or those on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, offer a unique window of opportunity. We have to grab it with both hands. Second, we need to accelerate progress on the ground, putting in practice what we preach. The challenge of climate change only exacerbates the existing pressures coming from marine pollution, unsustainable resource use or illicit activities. At the same time, the blue economy offers opportunities for sustainable economic development. So I am convinced that we can restore our marine environment while also bringing benefits to our coastal communities and the economy at large. Third, we need to strengthen our knowledge about the oceans. The start of the UN Ocean Science Decade offers the opportunity to advance the role of science and knowledge in international ocean governance. And finally, we will also now have to look at the implications of the current crisis for ocean governance and the ocean's role in the post-COVID blue-green recovery. The objective of the forum, starting with your discussions today, is to turn these challenges and opportunities into recommendations to the High Representative and the European Commission. I'm looking forward to the results of your exchanges and I invite you all to discuss them together at the meeting of the forum on 9th to 11th of December in Brussels, if all goes well. I wish you a constructive, fruitful, virtual debate. You know, you have all heard now the, um, what the commissioner said to us, which is our duty, our duty to support, to contribute to addressing international ocean governance, which is our main point of attention in the IOG forum itself. But you also heard that this was not an end in itself. It's only a means for achieving wider sustainable development goals uh, something that gets a special attention also today in our current uh, crisis situations. That's what uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson will remind us in his uh, welcoming address. He also is very much with us uh, supporting the process and he will share with us in a video uh, the main words uh, of welcome and support that he wants to give to us. I guess you all know Peter Thompson, a person, Fijian diplomat, active very much in many EU, UN initiatives with different heads, and that is now the uh, special envoy for the ocean uh, driving the implementation of SDG 14 in particular. Warm greetings, colleagues, friends, fellow ocean activists gathered in cyberspace for the International Ocean Governance Forum. Through all the trauma and sadness of these dark pandemic times, we must have faith that our trials will soon be over. And when they are, that we will find ourselves stepping out on the roads of recovery. Already we can see the crossroads ahead, so it's time that we fortify our resolve to take the high road that leads to a sustainable world. Humanity must not stumble back onto the temptingly low one, returning us to profligate burning of fossil fuels, and planet polluting single use plastics and wanton denigration of nature. The self-interest of our species demands that unprecedented reductions in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions around the world must be central 
to our building back better. Only then will we reverse the decline of the ocean's health and best secure our own. The high road to a sustainable world is the blue-green recovery road, the one that brings human and natural systems back into a harmony that is based on respect and balance. This must surely be the hallmark of the UN's BBNJ Ocean Treaty Conference and the CBD's post-2020 framework, moving, for instance, to a world in which at least 30% of the ocean is protected under effective and well-managed conservation measures. The blue-green recovery road has faith in the genius of our species, our powers of innovation, and our ability to share ideas and resources. Dear colleagues, as you commence your discussions today, please do so in the knowledge that you are contributing to the, po the positive momentum of SDG 14's implementation. Yes, the super year has been disrupted, and all our key conferences have been postponed, but no more than that. They will be held, and in the meantime, we have a responsibility to maintain the momentum and meet the targets set by international agreement. I give us examples. SDG 14.5's demand that we conserve 10% of coastal and marine areas by 2020. And SDG 14.6's demand that we eliminate harmful fisheries subsidies before the end of this year. These targets are enticingly within reach, so let us renew all available efforts to achieve them. Dear colleagues, gathered here in the virtual space of the International Ocean Governance Forum, we know the ocean will look after our needs as long as we treat it with respect. To do so, whether within our EEZs or out on the high seas, we must apply the best of our governance abilities through science-based planning and diligent management processes. Hopefully, it will not take another pandemic to drive home the message that we're all in this together that Homo sapiens has only one planet on which to live, and that we must govern our place upon it with greater skill and diligence, a goal that is clearly only going to be achievable through regional and multilateral cooperation. So more power to you all in your deliberations at this timely forum. I thank you. The role with the Commissioner and Peter Thompson, I think the aim and the target is set. Also the importance of the collective efforts that is required for all of us to find the solution and to put them in place. With this uh, political aim set, uh, let's now better grasp what the EU International Ocean Governance Forum can and will play as a role in strengthening international ocean governance. And I'm very pleased then to give a word and to welcome uh, Veronica Weitz, Director for International Ocean Governance and Fisheries, Sustainable Fisheries in the Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries at the European Commission. She will present in a nutshell the IOG Forum what for, which role, what can we expect from it? Veronica, the floor is yours. Merci, Pierre. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the oceans and the seas. Welcome to the first International Ocean Governance Forum, which unfortunately has to take place in a different format than initially foreseen. In view of the circumstances created by the coronavirus epidemic, we decided to convert the physical meetings into webinars to allow the stakeholder forum for the future of our oceans to commence its work. I'm really glad to see that so many have followed our invitation, regardless of the change in format. And I do hope that everybody is well connected and can see and hear me. So to start with, let me explain why we organized this forum. And I hope the first slide is on. The establishment of the stakeholder forum dedicated to oceans and seas worldwide is based on the joint communication on international ocean governance adopted by the Commission and the European External Action Service in 2016. The communication identifies three strategic priorities for safe, secure, clean and sustainably used oceans, 
and hence for achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 14. They are improving the international ocean governance framework, reducing pressures and facil facilitating sustainable blue economy, and strengthening international ocean research and data. The communication identifies 50 actions to achieve these objectives. The Stakeholder Forum for International Ocean Governance is one of them. This forum builds on the achievements of the European Union's international ocean governance policy over recent years. The first progress report on the implementation of this plan of action for the future of our oceans shows that we are well on track in implementing our policy. Oceans are increasingly on the international agenda. There is growing recognition that clean, healthy and productive oceans and seas are key for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And there is growing recognition that clean, healthy and productive oceans and seas are a prerequisite for a sustainable blue economy. This is even more true in times where we have to prepare for a blue, for a blue and for a green, a sustainable recovery after the COVID-19 crisis. It is evident that we need to upscale our efforts to strengthen ocean governance in its implementation to ensure, ensure clean, healthy and productive oceans and seas for the future. This view that more needs to be done is also shared by, the, by our member states, as you can see on the slide now, which shows the Council conclusions on oceans and seas of last November. These conclusions welcome also the establishment of the Stakeholder Forum and support the follow-up and further development of the European Union's ocean governance agenda. So what is the scope and what are the objectives of, objectives of that forum? With this forum, we want to provide an open and transparent platform for stakeholders within Europe and beyond to share understanding, to share experiences and to share good practice. We want to get ideas, your ideas, for further action to tackle the global challenge of ocean sustainability. Discussions of this forum will feed our reflections on how to step up ocean governance and to deliver on our sustainability objectives at the European Union level, as laid down in the European Green Deal, and at the global scale, notably those set by the Sustainable Development Agenda for 2030. The forum has three thematic working groups based on the three pillars of our international ocean governance agenda that you saw on the first slide. There are some horizontal topics, such as climate change, which will be discussed in each of the three groups. Uh, this should allow to consider them under different angles. The same is true for enabling factors like capacity building or funding in light of the transverse, transversal relevance. Results from the discussions in the three groups will be brought together to feed into further discussions. So let me now turn to the theme of thematic working group two of today. This thematic working group two is dedicated to reducing pressure on oceans and sea and creating the conditions for a sustainable blue economy. Oceans are subject to multiple and cumulative pressures from human activities, including from land. They are aggravated by climate change. All this is limiting the full potential of a sustainable blue economy. The European Green Deal has set out a new policy framework for tackling climate change with a very strong biodiversity angle and a zero pollution ambition, aiming at striking a balance between production and protection. Oceans are an integral part of this agenda. Here I have some questions for this afternoon. How do we strengthen the governance at all levels to ensure that they are clean, healthy, and productive oceans and seas as a progressive prerequisite for sustainable blue economy for current and future generations? What instruments and governance models should be implemented to develop integrated and innovative solutions for climate change that fully account for the ocean's role and potential contribution? How can nature-based solutions contribute to such efforts? Which roles for relevant organizations at different scales to produce pressures on the marine ecosystems? 
Ladies and men, gentlemen, these are just some of the questions that you will consider today, and we are really looking forward to hear your reactions. I will not go further into detail, leaving a more detailed presentation of the discussion paper to Pierre after my intervention. What I now want to like to do is I would like to wish you a very productive session, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion, to the results of your deliberations. I wish you a pleasant afternoon. Thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, Veronica. Many thanks for uh, the warm words in what is ahead of us and also for sharing some of the keywords that we are going to address uh, when we will look at a bit of complex uh, topic for this thematic working group that we will have split in different uh, components. I will add to your presentation some words to go back to the focus of the thematic working group two, and then guide to what will be the follow-up presentation and discussion on individual topics. This was just to remind uh, that even if we work on reducing pressures on the ocean and seas, there are many connections between this working group and the other working groups. And as we will travel in the topics that we are trying to discuss and address, we will probably today, like what we did yesterday with the first webinars on improving international ocean governance, realize of the connections between these thematic working groups. You all got the thematic uh, working group two discussion paper that presents some of the challenges and solutions relevant to uh, reducing pressures and providing, creating the condition for a sustainable blue economy. And what we try to do also is to start just to launch the thinking and the debate to identify key critical questions we would like to address in the uh, months to come. What is important there when we think about solutions is to think operational and to think about the preconditions that are required to make them implemented and effective. The discussion paper was produced by us uh, supporting the EU in this uh, program initiatives, was reviewed by the Commission and external experts. Some will then talk a bit later. It's clearly not exhaustive and we present the views, our views, and not uh, the views of the Commission. Still, it's a very useful starting point for our debates. As I said earlier, the topic is wide and it's not easy to address it. So we try to simplify this complexity into uh, six topics that you saw in the discussion paper. The first one addresses the management of marine space and how to ensure that we protect ecosystem in a proper manner. The second uh, looks at uh, the mechanism that would help us to uh, deliver a clean, healthy and productive ocean with many pressures uh, imposed on ocean ecosystem and with a special focus on uh, plastic pollutions and the issue of uh, the mechanism to put in place for getting a global agreement on plastic. As mentioned by Veronica, uh, a team that came in the free thematic working group is the uh, climate uh, and ocean nexus. Yesterday in the discussion we said maybe climate and ocean nexus is not right anymore, maybe we should say climate, ocean and biodiversity nexus. We will see whether we have the same uh, views from the group today. Uh, in the ocean, there is clearly an issue uh, with the delivery of food, ocean food resources, and the way to do it in a sustainable way. And finally, a topic uh, that is probably also very transversal is a question of putting in place the right condition for su supporting a sustainable blue economy. So as you see, six topics, probably all very interconnected as it will be demonstrated in the presentation later in the webinar. I would say we are at the end of this setting the scene session. 
the question now uh, would be to open the discussion to participants, uh, whether you get uh, clarification questions uh, to Veronica, for example, on the IOG forum process, on its ambition, the aim, or more specific questions on the work on the thematic working group two. Uh, floor is open uh, before we start moving to the topic dedicated session, which is the center of the webinar. Do, the, do use the question and answer uh, functionality of uh, Zoom. It's on the bottom part of uh, the Zoom uh, screen that is in front of you. And please do not hesitate to share your views or what you think is important to share the, to share this stage of the webinar itself. So first question uh, relates to whether there will be online consultation to provide more comprehensive feedbacks on the different topics. Effectively, uh, this webinar, as Veronica said, is the start of a process, start of a process that will have different consecutive steps. And there will be a point, I will go back at the end of the webinar itself, when we present the different milestone in front of us, there will be a point for an online consultation provide more feedbacks, not only on the, what was presenting in, presented in the discussion paper in its current version, but also what will come out of today's webinar and the follow-up uh, online workshops we are planning to do in a couple of months. So Pierre, there was also a, a comment on the chat, Mike Walker saying that it will be great to broaden it out to a biodiversity climate ocean nexus, uh, meaning the ocean's capacity to mitigate climate change is related to the healthy functioning of marine, marine biodiversity. Yeah, many thanks for the comments. As we, I said yesterday, we ended up with this conclusion probably in the next versions of the uh, paper, discussion paper, but also in the discussion we will carry out with some experts, will adapt this uh, and ensure that we talk about a nexus with three legs, ocean climate and biodiversity. Effectively very important and, uh, and important to bring this forward in the discussion we'll have in the uh, IOG uh, International Ocean Governance Forum. For the uh, one of the process questions also related to the webinar today, uh, uh, indeed, uh, there will be on each topic, I didn't go too much in the topics that we'll discuss today, but there will be opportunities after presentation from the different speakers to get questions and answers on the individual topics, uh, including uh, some of the comments made here, I see, on the a way to include, uh, to address the impact of uh, multiple stresses. Uh, that's an issue we will address, address in particular when we we'll go to topic two uh, on achieving a clean, healthy and productive oceans. So there is effectively uh, this issue of multiple stresses, uh, cumulative impacts, etc., etc., that we will need to address uh, and discuss. Maybe at that stage we could move uh, slowly to the uh, next a uh, big step of the uh, webinar. The next session is what do we mean by the different topics uh, for which I just uh, listing titles? Uh, the idea was to uh, provide you uh, for each topic uh, with a small time for uh, sharing views and thinking collectively of what this topic implies and for us to ensure that we have not missed anything in terms of what is in the discussion paper that will be the basis for a discussion in the thematic working group two. For each topic, we will have an introductory speech by a key expert. We will then put one slide that reminds us of the uh, questions uh, that we had identified on the specific topic sometimes already complemented by additional ideas. And then for each topic, we'll have a short discussions with question answers 
answers from our side, but answers also from the panelists that we will progressively introduce. A reminder, maybe, uh, the presentation given uh, that you will see later uh, represent the view of the presenters. But this is still collective work in progress. It's a complement what we had in the discussion papers in some cases with illustrations, good practice, and with all your uh, ideas, questions, complement that will give the basis for follow-up uh, work. The first topic is a very challenging topic, um, managing marine ecosystem and space in a sustainable manner, keeping in mind some social issues, shared values, etc. The topic will be uh, presented uh, by uh, Jan van Tattenhoven uh, from Denmark. Jan is Professor of Marine Governance and Marine Spatial Planning at the Center for Blue Governance of Alborg University. Uh, and his research uh, part he will share with us uh, in his presentation, but also in the follow-up question answers uh, deals with uh, institutional arrangements uh, in different maritime policy domains and processes of regionalization at European seas. Uh, something that we touch a bit upon in Veronica's presentation when she talked about the different levels uh, of governance that we should address. Jan, uh, floor is yours. Uh, welcome and many thanks for being with us today. Uh, Thank you very much. Ecosystem-based management is needed for sustainable and equitable development at seas and oceans. However, the implementation of EBM is complicated by two factors. First, no single authority is responsible for problems at sea and oceans. Maritime activities are regulated and, and governed at the international, regional, supranational, and national levels. At the regional sea level, there is a mismatch between different institutional rule systems and specific territorial locations. In this situation of institutional and ambiguity, there are no general accepted rules and norms, which gives room to negotiate new institutional rules. Secondly, each maritime sector has its own institutional dynamics, its spatial distribution, and is regulated at different levels. These sectoral governance arrangement coexist side by side. The result is a patchwork of conflicting maritime activities regulated by fragmented sectoral policies operating at multiple levels with specific governance structures and regulations hampering integrated solutions. To implement, to implement ecosystem-based management, you could think about a strategy of regionalization for the regional seas. First, it is important to develop strong stories, which are about visions, views of the future, uh, developed together with relevant stakeholders, which mobilize diverse kinds of knowledge. Such a story gives meaning and legitimacy to problems and possible solutions at sea. Examples are, for example, the, the development of a network of marine protected areas or the development of supergrids, energy networks, or transport networks. Another example is the development of integrated instruments such as transboundary maritime spatial planning. Second, the ordering of space has to be institutional embedded. This refers to the institutional design of regional 
cooperation and coordination. This could be done firstly by designing new institutions or redesigning existing ones. For example, integrated marine governance councils inspired by advisory councils. Second, by implementing reflexivity as governance principle. <laughs> reflexivity refers to the possibility to challenge institutional rules of the game and this courses. And thirdly and finally, to develop combined macro, regional and sea basin strategies to create land sea land or sea land sea connections. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Jan. Uh, many thanks for that. Many uh, challenging keywords that are in your presentations. Before we start the discussion, I remind uh, to the participants the uh, questions that were in the discussion paper. So effectively, uh, quite some challenges in how to support, put in place, holistic ecosystem-based management, with an issue of scales and scales integration, a specific question on how to develop uh, maritime spatial planning and marine protected areas in high seas, a question of guidance to support capacity and to enhance uh, performance of uh, mechanisms and tools that are dealing with the management of space, and then uh, questions, which is a very transversal question we will see, I would say, in each uh, topic. It's a question of financing, innovative financial instrument to support organization, to support an effective long-term management. The floor is open for uh, some questions um, on these topics. And I would also invite uh, the other panelists if they have any complementary uh, elements to share, uh, to do it also and don't hesitate to, to take the floor and share some of your views with the participants of the webinars. Any uh, from the questions that we, we see, uh, any reactions, let's say, from other panelists, um, there is some uh, reference from the question I see to invasive marine alien species, effectively not specifically referred to, but that can be added as a problems uh, with the pressure and some solutions to be found out. Um, may maybe um, if I go to, um, to, to Jan, um, when you mention uh, macro, regional, and the different scales, any views on what are the main constraints today that explain that we are not moving towards this type of solutions? Um, no, I don't have the impression that we are. We, we are there are some examples of macro, uh, regional strategies. Um, but if you want to realize a more integrated approach at the regional sea level, you could think about com combining uh, those initiatives around uh, macro regional strategies and sea the basin strategies. In some of the comments that were made, I think uh, there is some important ones uh, to remind us that effectively uh, we are not uh, starting from scratch. And there are initiatives and there are organization actors at different scales, which are already uh, moving uh, to bring some of the uh, ecosystem-based uh, management uh, principles into practice, with sometimes some very practical operational constraints that are faced. I think one of the issues there is also how to move this forward to ensure that it becomes uh, more the uh, general principle applies that's something that we find uh, in some pilot in some site in some in some regions effectively and in this case and that's what we also try to do in the uh, 
International Ocean Governance Forum is to build on this experience practices to identify preconditions for wider implementation. Any reactions from uh, panelists uh, there on what is here? Uh, we can, uh, because I'm looking at the time also, uh, we can also move to the next uh, topic. Uh, we will see very quickly that all these topics are very closely uh, related. Uh, the next topic is about um, achieving a clean, healthy and productive ocean. So there is an issue, if I go back to some of the questions on cumulative uh, stresses, cumulative uh, impacts that we will touch upon. And uh, uh, Chris Corbin uh, from the United Nations Environmental Programme, uh, based in Kingston, uh, based at the Secretariat for the Cartagena Convention, um, will uh, share some views on these uh, complicated topics. Uh, if you go back to the discussion paper itself, you see that there is a special focus on plastics and we have integrated uh, the plastic uh, challenge into Chris's uh, presentations. Chris, I give you the floor for a short presentation. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. It, it certainly is a, a pleasure to be here. And I just want to, to also welcome, welcome everyone to the webinar. Just to start off with some of the key, the key pressures that are associated with pollution and its impacts on our coastal and marine ecosystems. And these are widely varying from, from plastics to direct resource extraction to noise pollution. And what makes pollution such a, a complex issue to address are the multiple sources, whether it be from maritime related activities, sea-based, uh, the predominantly land-based activities. And, and now, especially now, we, we are more conscious of airborne pollution. Many efforts are going on at the national level, at the regional level, at the global level, but we have to consider how these cumulative impacts are now resulting in the continued degradation of our coastal and marine ecosystems and the ability to offer us ecosystem goods and, and services. And, and many constraints are, are facing governments at national and at regional level, um, not full consideration of our coastal and, and marine environment, our oceans, when developing national policies, which tend to be very much based on, on land-based objectives. There still tends to be a very sector approach in how we, uh, how we deal with pollution, whether it be control, reduction, prevention, or uh, minimization. As we look for solutions, we really need to look at multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral strategies that look not only at the health of the ocean ecosystem, but how does that respond to impacts of, of climate change? And I think most importantly, how are you also building the resilience of people of local communities that depend directly on that resource? To do that, we really need to strengthen our monitoring, reporting, and assessments. We, we really have to bridge, as we've heard before, that, that science policy gap. We, we need to identify what are the root causes of the degradation, which specific pollutants are the ones that are creating the greatest impact to environment and to human health, and therefore to be able to have a more responsive and adaptive response in terms of the types of policies that we implement. Bridging that gap between what happens on land and what happens in the marine environment is key. We, we, we need to have that integrative approach, whether or not it's through marine spatial planning, ecosystem-based management, and that has to be supported by very strong national regulation standards enforcement and generally the change in consumption and behavior patterns. Plastic pollution in particular is a challenging issue and, and there's been significant debate as to where those gaps are. The discussion is leading us towards the need for global agreement and we also have to see how can we maximize 
on the existing regional and global platforms that already exist. And this has to cover the entire life cycle of plastics from the design to a sustainable consumption and production, waste management, including the whole hierarchy of waste as a resource, recycling, reuse. It has to be fully integrative and fully participatory across multiple sectors. But what have we seen happening in, in terms of, of solutions? And despite these many challenges, I, I, I draw a few references uh, from our region, the wider Caribbean region, where I think partnerships are, are really key. And, and I've highlighted one here involving a, a private sector hotel chain, the Environment Protection Agency, various governments, and even cross-regional seas cooperation, where our regional seas in the wider Caribbean region has cooperated with the OSPA Com Commission. We have to consider as we are finding solutions that these have to be scaled. And I, I make reference to opportunities where we are promoting small scale recycling, benefiting local communities, alleviating poverty, looking at the sustainable development goals as an integrated package. And finally, we need more data, we need more information, but sometimes we need a leap of faith. And we've seen the efforts in the region and not just in the Caribbean, but in Africa as well, where many restrictions are, are taking place on the use of, of single use plastics. We didn't have all the data available to make those decisions, but that leap of faith has been taken. And, and therefore we have to, to recognize that, that this is something that is achievable if we all take action. So I just wanted to end with a video here that, that depicts it's about communicating with persons. I encourage persons to click on that link. Um, it's about breaking up with single-use plastics, and it's, it's a little bit of a, of a Caribbean flavor. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Many thanks, Chris, uh, uh, both for the presentation and finishing it with, the, I would say, a positive touch uh, with some experiences there. Uh, sharing also the views on the, the challenge with uh, information knowledge uh, on the potential impacts and some of the solutions we are talking about. If I go back to the uh, discussion paper itself, I just put again on the screen here some of the questions that were raised. I think from some of the comments there and also some of the presentation earlier in Jan's uh, talk, there was also always this issue of uh, partnerships, uh, combining, making links between organizations at different scales that emerge as an important uh, issue. In the questions also, uh, very central is the issue of the LANCI interface. Uh, as you said, uh, Chris, uh, many of these problems come from, from uh, the land. Uh, many disconnection between the two worlds, the two communities. And then finally, uh, at the end, in relation to plastic, but probably more widely, is an issue of thinking back at the overall uh, societal system in which we are in, and issues of approaches that provide an integration from production from two consumptions, which we feel is quite uh, important. Flo is open to question to, to Chris. Um, uh, I'm looking at, the, uh, at what has been uh, shared since uh, you're starting um, your presentation. Effectively, uh, from Alexander Sensi, there is uh, stressing again this Lancy connection, uh, an important part. Maybe that's something you could uh, talk a bit about. How do you see yourself, uh, Chris, some mechanism or way forward to make sure that communities from the land and from the sea start talking to each other, have the same uh, terminology, get a common understanding, and then as a basis are able to find solutions that are both have benefits for land and for the sea itself. A few thoughts on this? Yes, thank you. And I've been monitoring a, a few of the, the comments as well. I, I think here we really have a, an ideal opportunity, a, 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 a sort of a breeding ground of our small island developing states uh, in the Pacific and in, in the Caribbean and, and elsewhere, who, who almost have to live that integrated land coastal 
marine approach. So, so I think there are several lessons in terms of how they've approached a marine spatial planning, integrated coastal zone management, watershed management, where you have that cross-sectoral link. You, you need to bring together the, the tourism sector, the maritime sector, the agricultural sec sec sector, through national mechanisms that, that identify what are the main activities on land that are impacting on our coastal and marine environment, uh, whether it be impacting on fisheries and, and tourism, and, and establishing the mechanisms for meaningful exchange of ideas, of solutions, so that you're not seen to be sort of favoring one sector over another. Okay, many thanks there. Uh, in the questions that were raised, uh, there was also reminding us uh, the fact that there were some pressures coming from climate, uh, climate change. I think this will be something we touch upon in the uh, next uh, topic presentation and discussions. Uh, question on financing also. Marcus from Blue Action raised uh, an issue of combining funds from different uh, sources, in particular when we talk about multiple sectors, multiple stresses, cumulative impact, etc. Uh, this issue of integrated funding as a conditions for supporting integrated actions, uh, projects, etc. initiative that's something we will probably touch upon again in some other presentation. Um, any uh, issues with uh, Chris and maybe others about uh, the plastic uh, question itself? how uh, we talked about the need for a global uh, a global view and a global approach to that uh, maybe a couple of ideas of the bottlenecks that we need to cross and what is a bit the road to success uh, what is the main priority issues you think from your side we might need to address uh, apart from knowledge issues for example or the issues you had in your last slide that I guess we will touch upon again in tomorrow's webinar on data research and science policy interface. On the plastic side. Uh... Well, thanks, and, and, and the plastics issue is a complex one. I think a uh, few of the speakers, uh, uh, pan uh, um, panelists and, and participants have highlighted the, the importance of really a life cycle type of approach. And, and looking at it uh, not just from the production but the sustainable consumption, I think that is key. I think we have to look at it um, not purely from a standpoint of a pollutant that has to be controlled, but how does it link in, uh, to the other economic and, and social drivers. I think one of our participants highlighted that there are many, many studies, including within the EU, looking at the issue of plastics there's there's a UNEA uh, United Nations Environment Assembly resolution on, on looking at plastics and we really have to do I think a better job of bringing all these multiple um, activities that are ongoing so that we have a, a good idea as to what is the science now and, and what is the best way forward and then as, as mentioned coming towards the, the end in terms of a global agreement that really has to be inclusive if we move in that direction but we also have to look at the existing regional structures and other agreements, other conventions uh, that also deal with waste and plastics and how can we maximize those to have a bigger impact as well. Many thanks. If I go back also on some of the comments that we, we had, uh, uh, clearly uh, participants stress uh, the many other pressures that we might not have addressed properly uh, in the discussion papers it stands. There's a reference to underwater noise, for example, uh, clearly an emerging issue uh, that we will look at in the follow-up steps on the work of the thematic working group. And if I go back to what I said earlier, which is a bit my link with uh, the next presentation, uh, the importance to better stress and recognize uh, the pressures uh, linked to climate change and in particular uh, acidification. I suggest then we use this to uh, go to the next topic.
uh, which was uh, about uh, unfolding the climate and ocean nexus uh, topic we discussed yesterday uh, that is going to constantly going back to the discussion we have uh, in the different thematic working groups and uh, I'm very happy to, to welcome uh, Lorelai Picour, which is the Secretary General of the Ocean and Climate Platform, uh, coordinating the work on policy and international relations in this platform. And she will give us uh, some elements to help us thinking how to address uh, this nexus in an operational manner. For people that did not attend the uh, thematic working group one uh, webinar yesterday, there was also a presentation and discussions, a presentation by Jean-Pierre Gattuso and a discussion they followed. And then I would advise that you go back to the webinar video and then we can bring these pieces together at the end of the process. Lorelai, the floor is yours. Well, um, thank you very much and good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, I would like first to thank the organizers because it's quite important to, to be able to hold this important discussion, especially in this uh, very complicated time. So I'm very happy to be here and I will try to set the scene for the following discussion on unfolding the ocean and climate nexus and maybe should we say the ocean and climate biodiversity nexus already. But. So first of all, I, I just wanted to recall some of the fundamentals that the ocean is absolutely key in regulating the global climate system. And as you mentioned and in uh, Jean-Pierre Gattuso's presentation yesterday, he mentioned that uh, the, the ocean is also a victim of the growing impacts of climate change. And this is my, my first key message that the very best thing that we can do today uh, to protect the ocean is to reduce drastically and urgently greenhouse gas emissions. So of course here we, we fall into the, the scope of the UNFCCC and the, and the Paris Agreement. And pushing the recognition of the ocean in those climate negotiations is actually the very reason why we, we created the Ocean and Climate Platform in, in the first place. Uh, also mentioned yesterday by, by Joanna Post, uh, there are things happening. Of course, we, we had the IPCC special report on the ocean and the cryosphere, which was a, a milestone, but now we also have a movement to include ocean-related measures into the nationally determined contributions and a broader dialogue to, to better assess this intricate relationship between ocean and, and climate. But of course, and this is also why we're here, there is still room for progress. And to, to begin with, we, we need parties to the UNFCCC to seriously increase their ambition to achieve the objectives of the, of the Paris Agreement. But we, we also need to, to implement concrete actions and start thinking outside of the box to, to identify innovative um, solutions, but also innovative sources of funding. And in that sense, all actors of, of society, including the private sector, uh, needs to be around the table. And of course, the ocean must not be uh, left out of this uh, discussion. So here is my second key message, is that the, the ocean is an integral part of the solution in the fight against climate change with regards to both medication and adaptation. So on this, on this slide, I wanted to, to briefly lay out some of um, some few examples of, of these solutions, either adaptation, mitigation, or even hybrid solutions. Uh, such as nature-based solutions and the implementation of marine protected areas or the restoration of precious uh, blue carbon ecosystems. We can also develop uh, marine renewable energies in their different forms and sources, and of course, um, green the maritime sector. Uh, I won't go into too much details, but for those of you who may have not heard about the Ocean for Climate report, I strongly suggest that you look at it on the Because the Ocean Initiative uh, website because it offers a, a menu of uh, solutions that can be included within climate strategies, may be the NDCs or the national adaptation plans. Um, you have also seen in the, in the scoping paper that we have identified some leads on how to mainstream this uh, ocean and climate nexus. Of course, in the interest of time, I won't go into too much details, but I still wanted to, to talk about some of these uh, few leads. Of course, one of the priorities is to better understand this ocean and climate relationship uh, from a scientific perspective, including the, the role of the ocean in the carbon cycle. And in that sense, I also want to 
point to the upcoming decade of, uh, of ocean science that will start in 2021 and which should play a very important role in uh, boosting scientific efforts to, to improve that, that knowledge. Um, efforts should also focus on improving the monitoring and reporting of GHG emissions, including from the maritime sectors. And uh, we've heard about this a bit today, but since shipping, for instance, is regulated under the IMO, a very important uh, thing that I would like to stress is to build synergies among the different conventions uh, to help break down the silos and, and improve our, our efforts. Uh, cooperation is true within within conventions but also among different sectors and among different stakeholders which can allow for the establishment of tools to internalize climate change into ocean related decisions as well as investments in them and we can of course discuss this a bit further into into the qnr but um finally and to respect my my time slot i wanted to to conclude on a more concrete note um, as you all know, of course, coastal and island population are at significant risk from rising sea level and extreme weather events. And coastal adaptation will be and is already one of the most significant challenges that we have to deal with. Uh, this is actually why with the, with the Ocean and Climate Platform and other partners, we have decided to, to develop the CTS project to better understand, based on a scientific expertise, um, the different adaptation responses that are in place in different regions of the world. We have identified four so far and, uh, and to, to understand how to implement and better expand these solutions using a collaborative approach and the multi-stakeholder implications, obviously. Um, I will stop here now, but thank you very much for your time and I look forward to the, to the discussion. Many thanks, Lorelai. Um, I will go back to the, again, the questions uh, that were raised in the paper, uh, questions of monitoring, knowledge, uh, guidance, and how to ensure that climate uh, issues are integrated, internalized in the investment decisions. You talked about a nature-based solution also, uh, let's say clearly linked to ecosystem-based management. If you look at, at the chat and some of the question answers uh, that are here, but maybe some question on how to make sure that they take their due role and what are the uh, drivers that will uh, make them, I would say, uh, a type of measure that is considered uh, maybe more than what it is done today. And then the question that was raised earlier uh, in Pleasure's discussion is the issue of financing, how to adapt financing conditionalities uh, new or as what was stressed in one of the questions bundling uh, financing from different sources for example to support uh, move to to action any more um, uh, questions uh, i look at what has come from the chat uh, in particular uh, that uh, was in the while you were talking uh, discussion discussing i don't know whether laura you identify some specific issues that you would like to react to um yeah sure maybe since uh, we we opened the the seminar with that question is the, whether we should consider the ocean climate and include the biodiversity in that nexus and uh, and there are two arguments here the the first one is that when we talk about the ocean we talk about the ocean as the global ecosystem so of course marine biodiversity is included but um, it's also important to, to remind that the health of such marine ecosystems is extremely linked with our ability to respond to climate change and given the that we are in a governance uh, seminar it's important to also say that given the agenda the biodiversity agenda that will be up in the in the coming month even though it's, it has been slightly um, delayed it's also an opportunity to break down the silos we've heard this in many speeches but it's uh, we have one opportunity to do it properly and identify streams of work to combine the efforts of the UNFCCC but also with the convention on biological diversity and here of course nature-based solutions will play a, an absolutely key role mm. Uh, many thanks. Maybe one issue that is also transversal, uh, you would like to comment, but maybe other speakers, uh, panelists would like to comment was 
addressed by uh, Sergi Garcia on the capacity building. Effectively, we talk about uh, guidance, uh, uh, strengthening capacity in many of the uh, topic related discussions as a key enabling factor. Um, any views on what could be approach or uh, preconditions to, to change, I would say, the gear and make sure that uh, it becomes a, a reality, it gets more attention in your field, but maybe in other fields that we have discussed for other speakers. Anybody want to, to talk about that? And then maybe more from, from you, Lorelai, is also about uh, uh, nature-based solutions, I think, effectively, um, uh, how to make it uh, more happening and more effective. Uh, you see in the chat, there are some uh, references to nature-based solutions that are implemented in connection to marine protected areas, for example. Do you, from your side, do you have any suggestions that the group could build on? Um, of course, well, maybe on both questions uh, with, with regards to capacity building, uh, one of the particularities of the, of the Paris Agreement is that it put adaptation at the same level as uh, mitigation. And that's something that is very important because we have now realized that we don't have a choice. We will have to, and we have now, to adapt to the, um, the impacts of, of climate change. So, of course, capacity building is, um, is extremely important in that sense because Obviously, each region of the world will be impacted in a different way, and every ecosystem in the world will be impacted in a different way. This is why we, we are also trying with the Ocean and Climate Platform to, to develop regional workshops and, and better understand what's happening and what are the specific solutions in the regions. That's also what we've been doing with the Because the Ocean Initiative last year, many of you attended uh, the workshops on how to include ocean-based measures into, into NDCs and the discussions that we had in Europe and the ones that we had in the Pacific, for instance, were very different. And, um, and there is a cooperation here on, on how to expand those solutions because they exist. That's maybe the first message to, to vehiculate to the, the different member states is that some solutions exist. But of course, one of the, the key <laughs> um, things that will allow this solution is investment. Today, we, we also need to include ocean-related um, indicators into, into investment decisions, which uh, also means that we need to look at the existing frameworks that we have, maybe the, the Green Climate Fund. Uh, for instance, we need to identify some ways of funding more initiatives that uh, include marine ecosystem um, restoration or protections, for, it, for instance. And I don't know, maybe I can continue on the, on the nature-based solutions. We, we spoke a lot, of course, um, in the last few months about marine protected, protected areas and, uh, and their role maybe in the, in the NDCs or, or for adaptation. And w one thing that I wanted to stress as well is that we have been working with scientists and, and it's not, the only thing is not to say, oh, okay, we're going to implement MPAs everywhere. We need to be very careful about how we implement them. And, and science, science has now told us that uh, only highly and fully protected areas have actually uh, provided benefits for the ecosystems and for, si for societies as well. There were, there were some comments in the chat about effectively MPAs, also the, the need more related to the topic that was covered by Jan at the beginning about better understanding the factors that would make them more effective, efficient uh, for many of them. So probably something we will very clearly investigate in the context of the uh, thematic working group too. From the other panelists, any short thoughts about capacity building, the way you see it from your own perspective, because it's clearly a transversal issues. I don't know whether Jan or, or Chris, you feel like adding something to that from your topic related perspective? Maybe, maybe just the, the point that that already highlighted. It has to happen across varying sectors. Um, I've, I've seen some efforts at, at doing capacity building and, and training, but it, it's still being done very much at a at a sector level, and, and if you look at the, the issue of pollution and linkages with, 
marine protected areas or habitat restoration. You have efforts to do the climate change adaptation measure, but not necessarily addressing the root cause of why you're not having the marine ecosystem there in the first place, which is often land-based pollution. So I think, I, I think the, the issue of climate change does really offer an ideal opportunity to bring together multiple sectors so that the capacity building can be, can be really more targeted. And as has been highlighted, we, we also need to look at, at these funding op opportunities. I know the Green Climate Fund is, is, is difficult to navigate, to say the least, but I think we need to look at that and, and look at other sources of funding as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Many can. Thanks. I, I keep the idea that uh, uh, of a role climate change can have in forcing for more intersectoral initiatives and movement. Uh, that's clearly something we, we have been thinking about also. I suggest if there is nothing more at that stage and there is a few questions that are still pending. Many thanks uh, all participants for for sharing, for commenting. Uh, as I said earlier, we will use some of them later in our work. Um, I suggest we move to uh, the next topic. Uh, sorry is to go through these topics a bit in a hurry, but it's important for us in this launching webinar that we show the scene that we will then work with. And I will move to uh, the topics about managing uh, ocean food resources sustainably. Uh, a topic that will be introduced by uh, Mercedes uh, Rossello. Uh, thanks for being with us uh, today. Uh, Mercedes is an uh, international uh, law and policy researcher and consultant with strong expertise in transnational uh, fisheries governance. Uh, and she also has worked on uh, the control of illegal and reporting and unregulated uh, fishing. So, Mercedes, uh, floor is yours. Um, so, um, uh, yes, fisheries and aquaculture um, have an important role as a source of food and work security, especially for developing states. Um, fisheries are amongst the most traded commodities globally, um, and um, uh, uh, both fisheries and aquaculture are culturally important. Fisheries and aquaculture are also thought to have a lower carbon footprint than other protein production sources. Um, and for these reasons alone, fisheries and aquaculture should be a priority for investment and for sustainable development. Um, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, joint production reached 170.9 million tons in the two years preceding the publication of this report. Uh, fisheries has a superior production of 90 over the 80 million tons of aquaculture, but the trend suggests that aquaculture production is rising much more sharply, whereas fisheries production uh, has stagnated and is in fact now decreasing. Uh, nevertheless, aquaculture is affected by important sustainability issues that must be addressed um, and uh, clearly nursing the ocean back to health could reverse the trend uh, in fisheries in time. Uh, moving on to problems, we see that there are uh, a number of cross-cutting causes. Um, they are problems characterized by complexity and persistence. Um, first of all, um, it will be of no surprise to anyone, climate change, impacts on habitats and traffic chains, and can pose important governance challenges. Uh, second, pollution also impacts on habitats and species and calls for coordinated uh, governance approaches. Uh, third, poor coastal management uh, can be detrimental to cooperation uh, in ocean uses. And fourth and last, I wanted to bring up COVID-19 uh, because it shows us that these uh, are fragile industries. They are populated by fragile communities and that there is uh, therefore a need to focus on resilience in governance approaches. Uh, we move on to uh, sectoral or intrinsic problems. We see that they are also persistent and very complex and often highly interconnected. 
and certain problem threats are identifiable throughout fisheries governance, particularly issues concerning adequate data collection in scientific, operational and compliance matters, and insufficient data verification, poor data availability to build effective policies and to ensure coordination, and these are issues that are transversal to all these headings of overfishing, overcapacity, IUU fishing, and underreporting and knowledge voids. Um, and there's also some permeability into aquaculture, uh, particularly to do with the sustainability of aquaculture feeds. Uh, moving on to prospects, we see that uh, I wanted to give you, first of all, uh, a very quick uh, uh, case study, and it's the the issue of ghost gear. Um, it illustrates that we should aim at unraveling the complexity by identifying the interconnectivities for maximum efficiency. Um, ghost gear is essentially uh, lost, abandoned, or discarded fishing gear. And it's uh, basically plastic pollution that is generated by the fishing industry. And it calls for a coordinated approach to governance um, as pollution but also as a fisheries issue. Uh, courses are multifaceted, but it is thought that IUU fishing and poor governance leading to overcapacity, overcrowding of fishing, site, of fishing sites and uh, gear conflicts causing breakage uh, uh, are thought to be significant uh, factors um, in uh, uh, the production of ghost gear. And finally, uh, uh, again on prospects or solutions. Uh, it, it is seen that these are uh, complex and uh, uh, complex problems and realistically the responses will be complex too, but it will pay to look at the common threats, particularly data production and data-led cooperation. Um, we should strengthen existing institutions uh, with experience in data production processes. And also we should look at developing clear standards of responsibility and to the creation and practice of a culture of transparency and cooperation. Uh, the uh, uh, stand, common standards of responsibility and cooperation should be strengthened by finance opportunities um, and access to markets. Um, and that, that's all from me. Thank you very much, Pierre and everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Mercedes, uh, for uh, this uh, introduction, statements. Let's say, uh, if you look at the uh, questions we had, uh, you touch upon uh, some of them, as many were also in the chat or in some of the question answers about uh, saying we should start uh, building on existing institutional organizations. So there are questions about the role of regional fisheries management organizations uh, in relation to the performance reviews of these organizations. Uh, there are questions about um, mechanisms. You didn't talk too much about it on how to address illegal and reporting and regulated uh, fishing, uh, knowledge sharing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the questions, uh, there was uh, one element that made reference to consumption of seafood, and uh, maybe it goes back to what we said uh, in uh, the second presentation is a bit the holistic views from production to consumptions uh, on this important, uh, what we have called, what we have named ocean food resource uh, issues, even if maybe it's not the best word for covering all what we are discussing. Any views on your side on uh, this cons bringing the consumption side maybe a bit more uh, clearly into our debate and discussions, how relevant it is there's thoughts about it. Yeah, bringing the consumption side onto uh, problems of fishery production. Mm. Uh, yes, I think this is uh, very important. And I think the issue that this brings to mind for me is traceability. Um, and so it's the, the ability to identify uh, uh, the location where uh, fish is, is captured, uh, uh, also its sustainability and legality, um, and to be able to, to, to trace uh, to, to, I suppose to, to provide that information through the custody chain and ultimately to, consumer, to consumers. Um, so there are already a number of initiatives uh, in place. Um, these are 
uh, uh, initiatives that uh, operate both at the official uh, uh, stage. For example, um, the, the EU uh, uh, has uh, made an attempt to provide uh, some degree of traceability with its uh, EU IUU uh, regulation market processes. And then there are uh, much more detailed, close to the consumer uh, uh, initiatives uh, uh, that uh, I suppose, uh, uh, create a series of processes or methodologies to inform the consumer public as to the sustainability uh, of, uh, of the seafood that they purchase. Um, I think it's very important to join sustainability in capture to uh, successful market outlets. Uh, clearly, everyone's, everyone's a winner. Um, and I think there's, there's still work to do to ensure that uh, uh, these uh, uh, initiatives are uh, uh, fully fully effective, but nevertheless, uh, it, it's clearly there are some examples already out there, uh, and it's important to look at best practices to sort of inform uh, how uh, other initiatives could be articulated or improved. Mm. And then maybe if you look at. Uh the third question that was that was raised uh, uh, the question was uh, how could conference of the parties of different uh, international uh, issues climate change biodiversity could play or could support or could uh, bring a most uh, ocean food sustainability issues at the uh, front line and we started with a climate and ocean nexus and people suggested we should add biodiversity and people working on the nexus uh, traditionally also bring a very clear food dimensions how do you see this from your own perspective of enlarging the nexus in some of the discussion and processes that we are supporting uh, okay, so I think this is a, this is a very important uh, question in the context of these discussions. Um, I think that bringing uh, effective uh, information to, conf to global conferences of the parties uh, th that are able to bridge uh, issues of climate change and pollution and uh, uh, fishery sustainability is likely to be quite challenging. I think it's quite important that uh, existing institutions, particularly RFMOs, uh, are, uh, are strengthened uh, and are brought into play as participants uh, uh, able to supply information uh, to the uh, global conferences of the parties. And there's one particular instance, which is the, the conference of the parties of the fish stocks agreement, uh, where, uh, which we could provide a starting point uh, for this. Um, so uh, the, uh, I think that there, there's a pattern that perhaps could be taken as, as an example of integrating regional views into larger global processes uh, to be able to identify where these cross-cutting uh, elements are um, and how they could be exploited um, to, to improve the efficiency of, of policy proposals. Mm. And if I go back to uh, Lorelei, Lorelei, any views from your own climate and ocean perspective on the relevance of the QFIC Q3 questions and what could be the mechanism to, to progress and to bring the uh, management of the ocean food more clearly into your own debates. Any views, uh, Lorelai? Um, hi, yeah, sorry, I was trying to uh, reply to some of the questions on the, on the chat and discovering the multitasking on, uh, online. Um, but yeah, maybe some views is something that I forgot to mention, which I think is very important because we've had um, a few uh, mentions of uh, going beyond the ocean cli climate biodiversity, but also address lands and, uh, and, and the different aspects. And that um, makes me want to highlight that this is also what the 2030 agenda is for sustainable development is, is attempting to do. The sustainable development goals were never um, created to be, to be addressed um, in silos, they're all part of the of the same global objectives to address the social, economic, and environmental uh, dimensions of, of sustainable 
development. So I think that maybe we should keep this in mind in, in further developing uh, our environmental policies and, and keeping in mind that um, maritime sector and marine sectors are uh, very much intricate as well. And in that sense, I wanted to also bring up the um, European Green Deal. We have uh, all probably seen this uh, very ambitious document and, uh, and, and we were quite happy that the maritime sector was very well addressed uh, in the in the document the um, maybe the marine aspect was a bit uh, left out and um, very interesting uh, amendment or resolution I am not sure of the technical word that was written by the European Parliament um, also suggested that more marine and related dimensions were were to be um, uh, introduced and, and developed and, and I also want to recognize the work that has been done in the last uh, few months at the European level by uh, cl climate and ocean champions, such as uh, Deputy Catherine Chabot, uh, who have really, really managed to bring the, the ocean at the forefront of the, of, the, um, of the European Union. So thank you. Many thanks for um, Mercedes for your your speech, for your uh, presentation, and Lorelei for the uh, reactions also to there. Uh, because as we mentioned earlier, it's very, very difficult to separate these very closely integrated topics. If we go back to the start of the topic discussion on managing space, uh, managing resources collectively together, and where many people highlight the issue of building synergies between sectors, going beyond a single sector approach to cross sectoral issues. I think that's very important that we progressively uh, make these bridges uh, explicit. I suggest we go to the uh, next uh, topic uh, that will be the last topic of the day, uh, creating its half of the title of the uh, thematic working group two, creating the right conditions for supporting a sustainable blue economy. Uh, it's a presentation that is going to be made by uh, Jan Martin de Fett, uh, director at ECORIS, who is uh, currently uh, working on this uh, specific uh, topic. Uh, maybe what is important to say is that um, um, this is probably, again, a transversal issues uh, because creating the right conditions for supporting a sustainable blue economy has something to do with managing uh, space, uh, achieving a clean and healthy productive ocean, addressing unfolding the climate and ocean nexus, and then sustainable food. Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pierre. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, maritime friends, ocean friends. It's fantastic to see so many are still uh, in the in the in the virtual room uh, today. Um, it is, of course, uh, not easy to uh, to talk about uh, all the questions that you say. Of course, sustainability is a very complex term. I think we all know it. It has an economic, social, and environmental dimension, and these often provide all kinds of tensions. But also in the work that we do, indeed, candidly, as you say, Pierre, for DG Mara, we also emphasize the importance of the time frame to, to take a, a longer term perspective versus the short term perspective. And we see that a lot of activities also in the, in the, in the, in the, in the blue space taking place, which are, let's say, perhaps less sustainable, tend to have a short term focus, whereas obviously sustainable activities tend to have a longer term focus. But a third dimension, which is less commonly uh, acknowledged, but that we want to also highlight is what we call here the transformational dimension. What we mean by this is that it's important to be aware of business models uh, that also allow local actors to take uh, advantage of the benefits. And also, uh, obviously, the aspect of governance, including good governance. It goes without saying that it's very difficult to work towards sustainable blue economy if we're working with uh, governments uh, at a local, regional, national level that do have indeed not those uh, principles and the, do not adhere to those. So we see a lot of unsustainable practices going hand in hand with uh, 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 less than good governance. Illegal fishing was already mentioned a moment ago. 
So what we're working towards uh, together with friends of Deltalus also in the call here is towards a coherent set of sustainability criteria and indicators that somehow try to capture all of those points. Now, enabling sustainability also, it was already mentioned uh, several times today, requires an holistic and obviously also an evidence-based approach. This picture is meant only to impress you, but it means that often we focus on an activity. Let's, let's, let's call, for instance, uh, cruise tourism, mm -hmm. uh, which is currently, of course, uh, having a very low activity, so that may be good for sustainability reasons. But of course, there's a whole chain of activities, including the marketing, the sale, the building of the ships, the operations, and the servicing of ports that all go with it. Obviously, uh, it's very important to have a, a very good understanding of the uh, blue economy practices. And we'd say it's better to focus on practices than sectors, because sectors are too broad. And within a sector, we think there's a lot of possibility for both sustainable and unsustainable practices. Fishing and aquaculture, as just mentioned, very good examples. You've got good sustainable fishing practice and less so. And that applies to a lot of economic uh, activities in the seas that are good practices and less good practices. But also, and as the previous picture suggests, that there is, of course, a longer value chain. And therefore, we need to be aware of the fact that the whole value chain needs to be taken into account. And that can be done by indeed value chain approach, a more economic approach, or as already also mentioned, uh, the life cycle thinking, life cycle cost analysis in particular, that really is important to take into account when we want to get true insight and sustainability aspects. Impact assessments obviously are very useful and important, environmental impact assessments in particular, but as was already mentioned uh, before also, it is often very, very difficult to have an overview of what are the cumulative impacts. And I would say that depends very much also from place to place. So certain synergies between maritime activities can take place in one place, but they cannot take in another place. And obviously certain, um, let's say, activities like, for instance, cable laying is no problem whatsoever in, in, in some parts of the ocean, but other parts of the ocean where, of course, you know, the, 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 the ecosystem is more fragile. There are, of course, many more uh, difficulties. So that is very important. Third and last point. Uh, we heard already about the importance of innovative financial practices. I would say yes, but probably not, not, not all of it, because or at least that's not, not the whole uh, story. Because what we see is that a lot of finance is traditional finance. And there are really problems with, let's say, the mainstream financial actors. The first problem is they actually do not have knowledge of the blue economy. It's a very difficult uh, sector to study. And people in the financial sector really do not have much of a clue about it. So that's a problem because it means they cannot actually judge what they fund and what they do not. Even though there is, of course, let's say, increasing awareness also in the financial sector about environment, social governance, uh, standards, ESG standards, it still means that they do not uh, often, uh, not often geared towards uh, the, the blue economy. So there are therefore a number of mechanisms that actually prevent uh, sustainability and that also are the reasons for, for instance, the still the subsidizing of, uh, of, uh, of unsustainable practices. Not all of those are conscious, a lot of those are indeed, let's say, because of limited knowledge and awareness of this. And that brings me to the last point, a positive point also we've seen in our research also, the importance of development banks. Um, we, we talk globally, of course, so whether that is World Bank or Asian Development Bank or other, other development banks, public banks like the EIB, but also national public banks, which are becoming more and more aware of the importance of sustainability in the blue economy. And that can really play a key role and a leverage uh, to all of this. So, uh, Pierre, thank you very much. Uh, these were the key points I wanted to make at this stage. Thank you. Many thanks, Jan. Um, uh, many thanks for, as we've said earlier, a presentation that covers, in fact, that has a strong relationship with many of what was presented uh, before. Um, the different questions we, we had raised uh, in the uh, paper uh, you can see them here, 
there is effectively a reference to sound application of assessments in general, environmental impact assessments in particular, an issue of uh, understanding and capacity. Uh, you said not only for actors, but probably all of us, including the financial sector actors uh, that needs to be brought in. And then there was a, a wider uh, uh, issue with knowledge, innovation, and which uh, the right condition to put in place. So uh, truly sustainable blue economy opportunities are saved and fully saved. So I'm looking at the uh, questions now that we get. Uh, I think we already talked quite a bit about the, uh, the conditions for uh, blue economy, uh, sustainable blue economy before. Uh, there was, in some cases, uh, some comments in the question and answer saying that maybe in many cases we already know, we have already enough knowledge uh, about uh, what is right, what are the good practices, uh, and then the constraints are elsewhere. Do you want to react a bit on that from the experience? Uh, do we know enough about the uh, potential social, economic, environmental impact of some uh, initiatives, project sectors? Do we know enough about this impact ex ante? Mm -hmm the right decision or is there still a room for uh, more knowledge and better knowledge there? I would say there is still of course room to improve. We are working now on the two studies for DG Mara on exactly this topic. Uh, so it's work in progress, but I'm sure it will sooner or later feed more that we're doing a range of case studies exactly on identifying those practices. But I would say also when it comes to good practice and, um, and not so good practices, um, I think it's very easy when we talk about the blue green recovery road to talk about black and white. And I think that if you look deeper into a current practice, that the practice can have both good elements and not so good elements. And I think it is a danger in this work to, to pinpoint to particular actors and say they're the good guys and they're the bad guys. Because at the end of the day, uh, I think most people, I would say most, not everybody, is well intended, but the knowledge of what is the impact downstream or impact upstream or in an other sea basin of a, a particular activity is, is often um, uh, poor. So if you say ex ante, there's absolutely need for more ex ante work. MSP is of course a very useful framework for that because it is taking into account the local dimensions, but bringing also those dimensions into, into for instance, permits and also taking that into account to uh, finance. So you could say yes, you know, to support uh, public support, whether that is uh, from grants from the governments or whether that's from public banks. But prior to giving that grant, you know, we, we want to really have a better understanding of what those impacts are and obviously monitor them also along the way. So yes, there's more work to be done, um, and, but it's probably a big let's say, awareness campaign also on the, on the, on not only amongst the blue, uh, friends that are in this webinar, but also amongst the many actors that influence and shape the oceans that are not here at the table. There's one or several comments also that point to the fact that industry is, for instance, an important player. And I would say probably better to bring industry along. One trap is, and my last point here, one trap is to have a too defined definition of the blue economy and then to let the rest for whatever it is. I think that will be an, uh, an, a wasted opportunity. Because, as one of the previous speakers said, there is a potential to green even activities uh, which are currently considered less sustainable or questionable. Uh, there is probably still a lot of gains to be made in taking them along on the journey. So I would be in favor of a broader approach there indeed and make efforts especially to bring those actors uh, on board through the framework, as you mentioned, regulatory framework and financial frameworks. These two regulatory and financial frameworks seem to be really the sticks uh, that and the carrots that are needed to take a broader group of actors along into this wonderful journey. Mm. Many thanks Jan. Uh, we are getting to the end of the, the time we had for these uh, sessions. 
Uh, there's still some questions we need to address. And there is one on the uh, recently finalized EU taxonomy that Alexandra shared with us. I think that's whether how this tool will help uh, move towards uh, more sustainable blue economy activities. That's something we probably will uh, touch upon uh, when we move with more dedicated discussions after this launching webinars. Sorry for people that ask questions that were not answered. We are not losing them. As we said at the beginning, we will keep them for our further week. I propose that we move to the uh, last session, uh, final words and way forward. Uh, a few messages we want to share with you. In a few weeks time between May and July, we will get a topic dedicated online workshops with a smaller group of experts to try to play with the solutions that have been identified in the paper that were shared by some of you today in the question and answers uh, functionalities. So we will uh, share some information later on when this will take place. Uh, and then uh, over the summer, uh, we will uh, launch an online stakeholder consultation. At the beginning of the webinar, there was a question whether there would be some such opportunities. Yes, there will be. Uh, please look at uh, the EMD website at uh, the different information we will share. And finally, two key milestones. In December 2020 in Brussels, a conference of the International Ocean Governance Forum to share, consolidate the result of these first consultation steps. And then in the spring 2020 in Brussels again, uh, conference to share the result of the IOG forum on how best uh, the EU could support international ocean governance. I think that's all from my side on the uh, way forward. Um, we are approaching the end of the webinar. Uh, time to close it to take a bit of distance from all what we heard. Uh, what is still ahead of us and to think about the many contribution you gave to us, panelists and participants. The closing, the conclusion and the words of thanks uh, will be made by uh, Mariana Manse uh, from DG Environment, European Commission and John Brinkat from DG Mare, European Commission also. Mariana John, I'm very happy uh, to give you the floor, you as a co-chair of this thematic working group too, uh, for closing the, web the webinar. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Uh, good uh, afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to first start by th thanking the presenters for their very interesting presentations, as well as all the participants for the really ensuing stimulating interaction. And it has really been a pleasure to follow the webinar and to tap into the knowledge and expertise of the presenters and panelists. Uh, it is heartening to see how many, despite the limitations posed by the current pandemic, are so ready to dedicate their time to maintain the momentum of the super year of the oceans. As we know, uh, SDG 14 uh, has been recognized, has recognized the importance of conservation and sustainable use of ocean seas and their resources in the context of sustainable development. Unfortunately, despite the commitments we have all agreed to, the latest reports continue to paint a bleak picture of the status of the oceans, climate and biodiversity, with negative or worsening trends. And there has been a recognition that the implementation of SDG 14 remains insufficient so that the four targets due this year will not be achieved and require much greater efforts on our part. Similarly, uh, greater efforts are needed if we are to achieve the targets of the Paris Agreement to limit uh, the increase in temperature by urgently reducing greenhouse gas 
long-term missions as pointed out in one of the presentations. This is crucial for the maintenance of the health and productivity of the oceans we so much depend on for sustainable development. The lack of improvement has been of serious concern to the European Commission. Uh, we have adopted the Green Deal as well as the International Ocean Agenda um, as part of our response to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, the decline in state status, health, productivity and resilience of marine ecosystems, as pointed out by Chris Corbin, due to multiple and often synergistic pressures, erodes the resource base on which the sustainable blue economy depends and on which many countries increasingly depend to meet their legitimate development aspirations. Conversely, however, the development of ocean-based economies also increases the pressures on ecosystems which need to be considered and tackled. And obviously in this context, business as usual scenario will not be conducive to achieve a truly sustainable blue economy, SDG 14, as well as the rest of the agenda due to the interlinkages between the different goals and targets. So as, as has pointed out, the purpose of our deliberations is to try and identify appropriate governance solutions that can support the right decision making and planning uh, in order that oceans and seas can continue to provide for current and future generations. Any such solutions need to apply an ecosystem-based approach to the management of human activities, be based on the best available science while also integrating the precautionary principle in view of our gaps in knowledge. This is a prerequisite for achieving a truly sustainable blue economy and holistic management of ocean space and activities. And as has been pointed out, Tools such as environmental impact assessments, including cumulative impact assessments, need to support enhanced decision making. I also would like to stress that any proposed measures stemming from our deliberations need to fit within the existing legal architecture for the oceans, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. This is the overall legal framework within which all activities in oceans and seas must be carried out. And pertinent to what we're doing here, it obliges states to protect and preserve the marine environment, even in the, in the context of their right to exploit natural resources. And it also obliges states to cooperate for this purpose, what we are doing here today. Nevertheless, as pointed out in particularly the first two presentations, we are first with problems of fragmented management and siloization of activities and sectors through additional rules and regulations and competent bodies which need to be overcome if we are to achieve holistic management. And we need to identify the ways to improve the articulation between all the different bodies and instruments at the global and regional levels, while obviously respecting their specific mandates. One specific aspect that has been also raised and which is very important, uh, and which is recognized in many legal instruments, including the UNCLOS, as well as the 2030 Agenda, is the capacity constraints faced by many developing countries. And consequently, measures relating to capacity building and technology transfer need to be an integral part of any governance solution as an enabler of act action. I'll stop here and I'll pass the floor to Mariana, but I, I would like to thank the team uh, for the, for, led by Christos for organizing this forum and in particular Acteon for taking care of this working group. I pass the floor on now to, to Mariana. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you indeed for this uh, very interesting and inspiring discussion this afternoon. Um, I will uh, continue where uh, my co-chair stopped, so I'll uh, make reference to the importance not only to the strengthening of uh, international global ocean governance, but also to the high priority uh, of regional ocean governance uh, that uh, the EU uh, has. A uh, high priority on regional ocean governance is embedded uh, in the EU policies uh, through, for example, Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is the instrument aiming to address exactly cumulative pressures on marine environment that we've been mentioning throughout uh, uh, the uh, webinar today, uh, and that aims towards achieving uh, healthy, clean and productive seas. Uh, it actually calls for a strong regional cooperation, and our member states, for example, have been cooperating very closely with all the contracting parties in respective regional sea basins and uh, regional seas conventions, 
when they were de 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 developing their national strategies, marine strategies, and when they were developing programs of measures. So this is important because uh, re in this uh, whole effort, not only regional seas conventions have been developing integrated strategies, but also integrated monitoring programs, and they were supported very much and they collaborated very closely with the regional fisheries management organizations and other relevant sectoral organizations. But, uh, 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 well, uh, in order uh, to actually conclude uh, in uh, this uh, role of co-chairs, uh, we've been thinking what we could offer also for this discussion. So we thought it might be useful to highlight specific areas of interest uh, for the consideration of the group in the follow-up discussions. First of all, uh, there is this issue of achieving clean, healthy, and productive seas or the issue of addressing cumulative uh, impacts on marine environment, as Jan Martin mentioned in the discussion, which is important prerequisite uh, for building a sustainable blue economy. For that, indeed, uh, we do need a strong cooperation of all actors, of all stakeholders, as was mentioned, of all organizations with complementary mandate at all levels. So it should be global, regional, local level. The question is how can intersectoral cooperation be strengthened to support achieving clean, healthy and productive seas and achieving the conditions for sustainable blue economy? Uh, what are those policy interactions that might be needed? Or what are those uh, uh, frameworks, as Jan Martin mentioned, that might be beneficial for such interactions? Uh, second issue that we wanted to highlight is the biodiversity. Uh, despite this in seemingly, uh, in seeming wealth of the marine environment, marine species and ecosystems are declining. Biodiversity, including fishery re resources, depends on healthy marine ecosystems, so urgent action is needed there as well. Uh, in the context of the Green Deal, uh, the EU is developing biodiversity strategy, which will be important both for the internal work, but also for the external work. Uh, especially on the path to post-2020 biodiversity framework and also in the context of the decade for ecosystems restorations. So the question here would be how co can conservation of marine environment and ecosystems, how can MPAs together with sustainable management of marine space be better supported through strengthened governance? Next issue uh, is the pollution, which is very important. Uh, Next issue is the pollution, which is very important. Uh, zero pollution ambition is one of our priorities in the uh, Green Deal as well. And uh, Mr. Corbyn uh, explained very well a number of issues that we are dealing with here. Uh, when tackling marine pollution, we need to uh, look into the land-based sources of pollution, sea-based sources of pollution. We really need to have uh, inter-institutional cooperation to address even the challenges like uh, invasive alien species that my colleague Juan Pablo mentioned uh, is one of the pressures uh, to marine biodiversity. Uh, we need to uh, really uh, see how different interactions can be uh, supported uh, among different organizations that can help address these specific issues. However, when we discuss plastic pollution in particular, we need to discuss in depth what are those gaps that exist in, address the, in addressing plastic pollution at the global level? Uh, we need to consider the circularity approaches, uh, life cycle approaches, which was uh, very much mentioned in this uh, webinar. And we need to discuss also what specific issues would need to be addressed at the global level through a global instrument on plastics. Uh, this would also indeed uh, uh, give some reflections on how we can better uh, connect land-based pollution, uh, sea, so this land-sea interaction would thus be uh, also uh, addressed. Uh, in the co context of climate change, of course, climate and ocean nexus or climate, ocean and biodiversity nexus is suggested not only by Professor Caruso yesterday, but also supported today in the webinar uh, by our colleague Lorelei. Uh, it's very important. So we need to look into how this nexus can be supported through ocean governance responses. What are the policies integrated relevant actions? What types of area-based management tools are of importance in considering this nexus? 
one of the when, when we talk on, on blue economy, uh, I will just mention one of the most important activities uh, in the context of the blue economy, which is fisheries, and our colleague Mercedes uh, spoke very much uh, very much about uh, this particular issue. Um, there, indeed, uh, as pointed out yesterday, it's crucial uh, to consider it uh, for ensuring food security and nutrition objectives. However, at the same time, we have to be aware of the significant impacts, such as uh, those that are there through overfishing and destructive fishing practices. So the question is, how can uh, the management of shared fish stock by RFMOs and the fight against IOU fishing be enhanced? How can incidental bycatch and seafloor damage be further limited to contribute to improving ocean health and resilience, as well as more sustainable fisheries? Finally, it will be also important to consider how to improve data collection, monitoring, reporting, and data-based assessments at all levels, because this will give us really the information of the, on the status of the marine environment, on the health of the marine environment, on all those prerequisites that we have to have for sustainable uh, blue economy. So uh, in addition to that, it will be important to explore how different uh, assessments can inform each other or even build on each other, especially data-based assessments at the regional level, level, which could contribute to the global assessments. So these are important questions and important issues to be addressed in our future discussions. These would contribute also to addressing the gaps in scientific knowledge uh, to allow for the necessary transformative action to meet agreed commitments. So we need to improve our knowledge base to support better management decisions, strengthen science policy interface, and raise the level of ocean literacy. And the forthcoming UN decade on ocean science will certainly provide some answers in this respect. Uh, as you know, these aspects are also some of the themes uh, for tomorrow's webinar. In that sense, uh, I would like to encourage uh, you all to continue contributing to our deliberations over the coming months. Uh, the European Commission is interested to understand what you as engaged stakeholders consider to be priority areas for action to improve ocean governance in order to ensure conservation, address pressures, and create the right conditions for sustainable blue economy. Uh, with this, I would like uh, to conclude by thanking all the presenters, uh, all the participants, and the team of assistance mechanisms for this forum, led by Fresh Thoughts and uh, uh, Acton for this working group. And we look forward to continuing this interaction over the coming months with all of you. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, uh, John and Mariana. Uh, of his words. Uh, for all participants, many thanks for being with us, for contributing, participating. You heard many words, holistic synergies, cross-sectoral, bringing private sectors, etc., etc. Maybe one that we didn't talk too much about, that there was in one of the questions, was local communities. That's also something we touch upon yesterday that maybe we need more attention. For now, I just wish you a very, very uh, pleasant evening or day. Stay home, stay safe. And we hope that uh, we gave you a flavor and we, you want now to continue to work with us. Just uh, bye bye and see you at next webinar. <laughs>